Now this morning's focus is going to be on repentance. Now I don't know about you, but for me the word repentance pretty much often has a kind of a negative content, <coughs> a negative feeling like, um, oh, you've been caught and you're so bad and you better straighten up and <laughs> it easily has kind of a, a negative corrective tone and so it's amazing how quickly people get turned off when, they, when you start talking about repentance. However, this is such an incredible story. <clears throat> As I, I think I told you recently, I've begun reading through Richard Baxter's book on uh, a um, treatise to the unconverted, treating them to be, to repent, or treat, treating them to return. Oh, I didn't say it two Sundays ago here? Okay, well, that, that's fine. So um, the, the book is based on this verse, and uh, it hasn't arrived yet, so I can't wave it in front of you to show you off, but I have it on my um, Kindle. But um, it has this, this verse, let's go ahead and read it. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So this is a classic Old Testament passage on repentance, but I love this passage because it gives the functional meaning of repentance to turn, to turn away from our worldview and toward the Lord and his worldview. Now, this book of Ruth is taking me by storm uh, in terms of its incredible sensitivities to this topic of repentance. And what I did for this morning's message, we're just going to be talking about the passage, which is most of the chapter, where Ruth is returning to Bethlehem and she attempts to get her daughters-in-law to return to their own country, to their own mothers, to their own people. And Ruth wants to return with her mother-in-law and, and thus she does. Now, as we are sensitive to the whole meaning of repentance being the concept of returning, it's important that we understand something that's significant, and that is this. As you know the Lord, the more tender the Lord is to you, the more real the Lord is to you, the more awful it is also when you imagine that people that you know in your, law, in your life are wandering about making passing judgment on this life as if it is life and indulging in it as if it's the fullness of life and they have no thought of the fact that this is not but just a temporary passing panel of life and they are going to live forever somewhere and the Lord is calling out to them to turn because he has no pleasure in their death. Now the, the intention of the concept of returning is to get us to think about the important things of life in a really much more realistic and better context. Um, there's a passage in the New Testament, I think it's Romans, that says, um, if you live after the flesh, then after the flesh, you're going to receive destruction. Now, it's really easy for us to quickly say, well, yeah, yeah, well, I don't want to be a fleshly person. I want to be a spiritual person and I don't want to live after the flesh. And we sort of characterize the word flesh simply as an evil thing. But the flesh, while it has its evil propensities, especially in desiring to be pleased at the moment, the thing that's so prominent about the flesh is that it's temporary. And so everything that you invest 
into a temporary shelter, as it were, will be destroyed, will be lost. And it doesn't matter how goodly and how kindly and how um, thoughtfully you've laid your investment. It's, it's sort of like this. There's, this is a really instant idea, I mean, illustration, so it's not that deep, but it's like you're harvesting your field. And I guess it's like the story of the three pigs, you know, or the, and, and you have two choices. You can build a stone harvester that will hold your seed and protect it from weather and storm and fire. Or you can quickly and hurriedly just build a little wooden shack of, to get a little bit of, of a roof over it and you know, keep some of the sun out and some of the wind and rain out. But there's a fire coming. Now you were told there's a fire coming and you were told the fire burns everything in sight. So you have to have this stone tower that your grain's in to protect it from the raging flame. And so you can imagine that if you are in a hurry and you build your little shanty really quickly out of wood and get your grain in there so you can go play, you can imagine easily that, well, wait a minute, what'd you do that for? There's a huge fire coming. What good did that do? You might, might, might as well just left it in the field. Of course, you can readily see that. So you wanna, if you want to preserve your seed, you have to take the effort to build that stone fireproof tower to keep your seed in. So when the fire comes, it's protected. I realize that's a little bit, it's a little bit silly, but in terms of illustrations, but, but, but that's the basic reality of life. And Jesus said really plainly in Matthew 6, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness he'll take care of the things that you need right now but you're going to secure an eternal treasure so he's under the umbrella of talking about lay up for yourselves your treasures in heaven and he, and he declares it where moth and rust and thieves don't break into steel so we're we're called to live that kind of a life and that's that's who we are we're spiritual people so every single day every single day of our life there's a stressful temptation for us to measure our life in the immediate terms of enjoyment of this life and to be tempted to foolishly think that that's okay because I'm going to get a little bit of extra play if I do it that way. I'm gonna have a little more fun if I do it that way. And when you begin to think about, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We're talking about time and eternity. Time is ticking away. I went to Nana's, I want to call them old timers. I, call, I called them yesterday old timers, but it's good timers. <laughs> They're a good timers club. And, um, and most of these people are the first Christians I ever met after, as I was a new believer at, at Hereford Baptist. And it was just sweet. But it was just astonishing for me to see how quickly we age. I'm looking at them and when I met them, they were in their prime. They're in their early 40s to middle 50s, I think, and there's the range. And there, there we were sitting all there and, you know, I'm still a whole lot longer, I'm a whole lot younger than they are, but I didn't want to look in the mirror to realize that I wasn't very young, <laughs> comparatively maybe. And of course, we don't have the guarantee of our next breath. So, I, I'm really having a hard time with my sleep this, this, I don't know, last three or four months. And I really like to go to bed early. But when I mean early, I'm meaning really early. <laughs> I got in bed at six o'clock last night. And I, I, I succeeded in waking back up for a few minutes to try to do a few things and then I wake up with the phone ringing and Sally's calling me at 11. I was sound asleep. But one of the dangers of going to bed early is 
then you wake up. So I talked to Sally. I was like, oh, no, I can't go back to sleep. But that's all right, because that was part of my plan. When I wake up, I'll get up and have energy to work on the message for today, which I did. And I didn't get back to sleep till almost four. But I, I didn't make many slides. I have the I have the story on slides, I guess, which which we went through. And I probably wish now I had done it the way I have it on paper here in front of me. But what I want us to do, I want us to look at the Book of Ruth, chapter one, and I want us to see some snapshots because it is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. The, the story behind it. Now, because we've already read the story once and we're going to read it a couple more times, we have to ask a couple of questions. Well, what's going on? And I want to say a few things here. We'll go ahead and turn to the first panel. Now, I went ahead and I substituted the meaning for all the Hebrew words that were simply transliterated in the, in the translation on the screen. And so, as I go along, I'm, I'm going to read and talk, okay? So if you're going to take notes, you have to pay attention because I'm not going to say, here's note one for your essay. So it came to pass in the days when judges ruled. I just love the way this whole book starts. <laughs> well, a beautiful account. You're getting the story. That there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, and the meaning for Bethlehem Judah is this, house of bread, or li more literally food. House of food, house of bread, and praise, Judah means praise. And a certain man of the house of bread, praise, went to, certain, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. And the definition of Moab is of my father. Now, I want you to get the contrast here because we're talking about repentance, but we're making it really simple because we're, we're talking about repentance in terms of directional living. In which direction are you living? So here is this man who is in a land that, of famine that is the famines from God as part of his correction to bring them back to repentance. And so this man from the house of bread prays, he goes to the house of my father. He goes to the land of my father. Now, of my father, if you remember, Moab was born by Lot as the two daughters both conceived, Moab and, and um, what's the other one? Moab and Ammon, thank you, thank you. So, <coughs> You have this huge setup here going on. There's the center of place where God has provided, and then there's this place of refuge of my father. And I want you to understand that in your whole entire life, there'll never be a, there'll never be a day that you don't have to choose between that which is of my father, that's the more naturalistic sense, what looks like security, what looks like health, what looks like recovery, you're going to have to choose between that and that place where God is. What looks like recovery is what? It has food. And I'm averse from God's place that he has for me because there's difficulty and hardship there. And so we see the, the picture. Now, I'm not going to say that um, there was sin in them going to Moab. I'm just totally overcome by the meaning of the words and the structural symbolism that it entails because I've got to make a choice in my life. Every day I've got to make a choice. Am I going to choose what looks like a little more easy path, a little more um, substance, a little more happiness, a little more pleasure? Am I going to choose that or am I going to turn and am I going to choose that place where God is praised. That place where God provides and out of that provision, God is praised. So let's keep on reading. He and his wife and his two sons, they went to Moab. And the name of the man was Elimelech. My God is king. And the name of his wife, 
It's Naomi. My delight. And the name of the two sons, Mihan, sick, and Chilion, pining. Ephrathites. Now look, I didn't give you this two weeks ago. Ephrathites. Ash heap. Place of fruitfulness. I spent hours trying to figure this one out. Give me a break. What do you mean ash heap and place of fruitfulness? I mean, I do know that there are times when you put ashes on your garden and you have a more productive garden for certain kinds of foods. I understand that, but come on, give me a break. How in the world did that name, Ephrathite or Ephraim or whatever, how did it get, how did it get named like that? And when you're doing the DDM method, you're supposed to give a little bit of background. What, what, what was God doing historically? And this is one of those cases where that name is the link to what God's been doing. And guess what happened at this location many, many years ago? The favorite wife of Jacob died in childbirth with Benjamin. I did, did somebody say something? Oh, you just said, wow. And this, the, the, Bethlehem sometimes is interchanged with the Ephrath, or Ephrathite or whatever, Ephraim, but, and it was named right there because here Jacob, the ash heap, the beauty of, the delight of his life died. Rachel died. But in her death, Benjamin was born. And there was fruitfulness and prosperity. And of course, you know the story of how precious Benjamin was to Jacob all the rest of his life. So we, we find this snapshot, and I realize I don't know where else I'm gonna say it because I'm talking about it right now. But this story is surrounding someone who is in the line of Jesus. And so my mind remembers without actually going to the passage and I haven't memorized it perfectly. But I remember this saying in the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, but thou Bethlehem, Judah, though thou be the least, a ruler shall come from thee. And then we have that other place, Rachel weeping for her children, the ash heap, all those killed children killed. Rachel weeping for her children because they were not. And so I'm just stunned. I'm, I'm, I'm mesmerized by the beautiful portrait of repentance. If I can't win your heart in any other point this morning, I want to win your heart on this point. God has fruitfulness for his people out of the ash heap. And you and I must pass through that which creates an ash heap of our earthly, carnal, temporal desires. We must pass through that in order to get that heavenly and that divine appointed fruitfulness. And my plea to us all is, can we slow down just enough here to recognize that a momentary joy that keeps me from an eternal understanding and rejoicing in God's goodness. It's just not worth it. I want the long lasting treasure. When I was chatting with this one couple across the table from me, I, I had a really good day yesterday, okay? I started out really discouraged and threatening to be depressed and ended up having a chance to share the gospel with an older man that I'd known for years. And it just bubbled out with such joy and I, um, when I finished, I was just so delighted and I was just really looking forward to coming to these old folks, going to their tramp roast. I dressed up like a tramp. And I was just, I was asking the Lord to give me, give me a spirit of uh, love and kindness and communication, which often happens when I'm around those folks. But I'm just telling some of these stories. The stories are just bubbling out. And um, somebody remarks on the story I told and, I, and my remark, I don't remember exactly my comment, but my remark was something like, well, but yeah, that's what worship is. It's suddenly realizing 
what God was doing all along when all I could see was the ash heap. All I could see was the difficulty and the sorrow. And then I said this one phrase. I said, you know, when we get to heaven, heaven's simply going to be a telling of all these incredible stories where our end was the ash heap. And God's going to tell the story from his perspective and we're going to see the fruitfulness. And this one dear lady looked at me and said, I never ever thought of it that way. Heaven's going to be where we get to see the stories from God's viewpoint. Now I just want to, I just want to tell you, it's a joyful thing to trust the Lord and then reap out of the ashes the fruitfulness that he has for us. It's a wonderful thing. I just want to share in eternity our whole abounding joy is going to be springing from that knowledge. And so today when you and I come across people in difficulty and hardship, we need to really understand they are at a prime moment of incredible opportunity to trust the Lord and not give in to the temptation to fix the problem immediately so they can be satisfied temporarily and miss out eternally on the great goodness God has. It's just so incredible. We have got, we have got to make choices. Well, let's keep reading. I'll keep talking. Wow, the time is ticking away. Did you take a really long time when you? A little late. Okay, good. So I'm not going to be totally oppressed. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> let me get back. So, uh, the name of his wife was my delight. The name of his sons were sick and pining, and they were Ephrathites. That is, an ash heap replaced the fruitfulness of the house of bread and praise. So they came into the country of Moab of his father and continued there and <clears throat> my God is king my delight's husband died and she was left with her two sons. Now pay attention okay it's important I mean the poetic power of she was left and her two sons. You, you have to get that. The way your version read it this morning is like robbed. Is that New King James? It robbed the meaning. She was left and her two sons. You have to understand, okay? We're people and we're so tempted to define our existence by our possessions. And especially, what? Nah, your version didn't say left. She was left and her two sons. Okay, well maybe it was the next one which is more important that it changed. I caught it on the next one, I guess. Anyway, let's not have a fight. We're on live stream. So, so, um, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, she was left. They were left. They were left. Now, I want you to understand something. That is the human emotion that drives us to grasp and grab and save our life. Oh no, I lost my husband. Now I've only got two sons left. Just remember that. Continue. And they took them wives of the women of, his, of, of my father. And the name of the one was Orpah, which means gazelle or back of the neck. And the name of the other one was Ruth, which meant friends. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And again, children, the 10 years was from the time they moved to Moab, the time they went back. That's the whole story takes place then. And you don't have a timeline between how many years they lived before Abimelech died. You just know that the 10 year period, this all takes place and the story continues rapidly. And sick and pining died also. And a woman was left of her two sons and her husband. That's all that was left. So all of her possessions, all of her identity, all of her sense for a woman, it was huge back, to back in those days especially. And she's left and she has nothing left. She didn't even have any grandchildren. And so <clears throat> she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return to, excuse me, from the country of his father, for she had heard that, she had heard in the country of, of his father that 
uh, how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread, giving them food. Now, here's, let's take a picture here. I want to pause. We're talking about repentance, okay? And so we set our course. And I just want you to get the picture. I don't necessarily want to make any judgment on this. I want to state the facts. So this family moved to Moab because of the famine. Now, a famine children is when you don't have any food, when the crops are withering and fading and you're not getting any crops and you're having a hard time finding a place to eat. Food is pretty important. And so when a man is trying to provide for his household, he knows he wants to provide so that they can eat. And so he went to a place that he could provide for his family to eat so that they might live. And while they were there, at the place called of my father, he was like a man trying to provide for his family so they could live. And they died. Do not miss that credible snapshot of reality. How many loaves of bread did they eat before they died? I don't know. I don't know. But the land of, of my father is not the place of my prosperity. The land of my prosperity is in the place of praise. The, the, the house of bread where I bring praise to God. So picturing that and going forth, now she's willing to return. I want you to understand this is repentance. She's changing her course. She's going in a different direction. And as you have remembered the passage being read earlier, she's very much aware that God's involved in this and she's recognizing in her mind as her understanding goes that God has brought punishment to her and she's returning. But I want us to understand in terms of this turning it's structural and directional. Repentance is less words with your mouth and more actions with your life. And so she was going back. You can say she was going back for the same motive that she left. She heard that there was food back there so she can return to eat. But nevertheless, she's returning back to the land that they went from. <clears throat> now at this point the daughters it appears were just totally a part of her household and they were in the process of going back with her and as she begins to go out the next paragraph reads wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law and they went on the way to return unto the land of praise that's cool I like that And my delight said to her two daughters-in-law, go and return each to her mother's house. And the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me, well, excuse me, have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you might find rest each of you in the house of your husband. And she kissed them and lifted up their voice and wept. Now I want us to get a really good picture of this emotional transaction that's taking place. I really eat my heart out. It's been one of the hardest parts of my whole life in ministry is to see Christian families get caught up in existential thinking. Now that's a fancy word. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. See Christian families get caught up in living for the moment and making decisions of life based upon the temporary circumstances of life, the temporary matters that they're gonna be functioning and caring for in life. And so what we have here is classic wisdom from the land of Moab. Classic wisdom from the land of, of my fathers. And as we go forward, I want us to recognize that Naomi is encouraging her daughters to repent from following after her. So she's asking them to turn. Now, the first time I ever heard this story, it really, really bothered me. It went, it went deep to my soul. Why in the world would she send them back to their pagan gods? What is, what is going on in her head? 
And I want us to see that when we are caught up in the emotion of our existence, our empathy and our compassion so quickly distorts spiritual reality if we filter it through the moment and the benefit of the moment. So, we have my delight encouraging her two daughters-in-law, listen, you need to go home to your own mothers and, ha and get husbands and the like. She had no imagination of any kind that there was any hope for them whatsoever in returning with her to the land of praise. Now when we talk about repentance, here's the thing that frustrates me often. What often happens is some dear, loving parent, often, or counselor, speaks to a child or someone they've been called to counsel and tenderly and emphatically presses on them the need for them to trust the Lord, the need for them to not give in to the fear of the moment and not to try to save their life. And they press them to think and then other counselors come in from the outside and scoff and mock and belittle. They'll belittle the authority. They'll belittle the ideal. And it's such a naturalistic of my father kind of counsel for people to look at their life in its immediate experiential form and choose that which really seems to be the most propitious for life on this earth at this point. And this is, this is Ruth, she has these two loving, loving daughters-in-law, and she is so embittered by her loss, she is so embittered by the, 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 the stain and the sting of her temporal loss, she has no capacity whatsoever as a loving mother-in-law to have a vision for her daughters-in-law that God, the God of her fathers can meet their need. And so she preaches a heavy message to them to go back. That was round one, they respond, round two. And they said unto her, surely we will return with you unto your people. So their heart is set on turning. You know, the Bible talks about it's, it's imperative or it's necessary that offenses are going to come, but, but woe be by whom they come. And as a pastor for some 40 years, I've had so many occasions where I've just broken my heart to see worldly-minded people, whether they be calling themselves Christian or not, they're exclusively looking at the temporal earthly circumstances. And their advice is exclusively centered around preserving happiness in the moment, providing opportunity in the here and now. And the temptations of youth, what, what are they? The temptations of youth are simply one. You're raised up in the house of your parents you get old enough to discover, oh my, other people don't live like us. And you start measuring, and you start wondering, and you start torturing yourself with the imagination that you're losing your life. That you're being harmed, and that you need to be rescued, you need to deliver yourself, you need to get out of here. I'll never forget the first time I came across this. I was just so, it stung and it, it was a wound, a deep wound. But I was discovering that there were people in our school and people in our family that were writing one of my children. And this is the message they said. Just hang in there until you get 18. And then when you're 18, you're an adult and you can go on your own and do as you please. And that's the Moabitic way. 
Let's, let's look at our life and the excitement and the thrill of living that's momentary and passing away. And let's make that the priority. Let's make that the choice. And see, it's a turn. It's a turning away from the place that you were born and raised. And there's always an element of faith in the place you were born and raised because you rested in that house. And so you get tormented and you want to turn away. And you want to look to something else. You want to look to the land of my father and have life. I mean, those, those two daughters, they were just that kind of daughters. They were so worried about not being able to have a husband, not being able to have children, that they, they treacherously tricked their father into getting them pregnant so they could have kids. That, that's an amazing snapshot. And here we are in the drama of the 10th generation, as it were, since Israel arrived. And this is taking place. And these two dear daughters want to return. I have no idea all that was in their heart and soul. I do know there was a little bit of more love and care and vision in one than other, by the way the story turns out. But continuing on, <clears throat> my delight rebuts, pressing them again to return, to, re to return from repenting, turn away from this course that she was on. And my delight said, turn again. So there's that word, turn again. No, don't turn and come with me. Turn around and go back to your people. Turn again, my daughters. Now listen carefully to the Moabitic, the Moabitic logic that she uses the, from the land of my father, of my father. Why will you go with me? Are there yet sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, and go your way. For I am too old to have a husband. And if I would have a husband this very night and bear sons, would you hang around and wait for them till they're full grown? Would you stay from having husbands? No daughters, no daughters. It grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now this is the most treacherous battle of parenting. This is the most treacherous battleground of human love. When I, myself, see myself as the cause of suffering or sorrow or lack or loss in my children and those that I love and care for, and I get so focused on the, the misery, the problems, the difficulty, the sorrow, the lack, get so focused on what those I love don't have because they're associating with me, I lose all vision of who I am. And I just want to say one thing. Her logic was Moabitic. It was the logic of the Moabites. What's important for me, what's important for me is that my earthly lot is fixed well. Because that's why I'm here. And why in the world, daughters, would you go with me? Your purpose in life is to have a husband, is to have a heritage, is to have children. That's your purpose in life. And don't tag along with me. I am no longer any means by which you can have life and you can have happiness. And I, if, if you could understand the hugeness of this. I've been in Christian home after Christian home for 40 years. This is the battle. This is the battle of repentance in every heart, in every home. And when you, whether you're a parent like here, <clears throat> my delight when you're a parent like her and all you see is the temporal vantage that you want your child to have you're going to turn them over to pagan gods so they get what they need so they get what you think you want their worship of pagan gods was less important than having a husband it was more important to get a husband and I imagine Ruth probably imagined I mean not Ruth but Naomi probably thought well, these Moabitish women, no, but no, no Jew is going to marry them. They're already married anyway, and there's no hope for them at all. So this is a huge picture of repentance in such a glorious, wonderful way. <clears throat> this woman is looking at her life. God is against me. The Lord, hand of the Lord's against me. And so she's surrendering her own sacred place 
in the lives of her children. And she's giving them counsel not to repent. She's giving them counsel to go the way of the world. <clears throat> and so the story continues. Stage four, section four. They lifted up their vo voice and wept again. And obviously they loved each other. It was deep intimacy. And Gazelle kissed her mother-in-law. And all you saw was the back of her neck. She was gone. Fleeting moment. But friend clung to her. Section five. My delight again presses. And she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou also after thy sister-in-law. Again, trying to unrepent or repent the repentance. Turn, turn, go this direction. Go after your own interests. And I just want to pause and say for a moment, do you realize how difficult temptation is for the human spirit? It's almost, well, I shouldn't say almost, it is absolutely impossible to resist temptation from the land above my father if you do not have a vision beyond the land of my father, if you do not have that. And it's, and it's remarkable to me, this story caught me off guard because here we have the mother-in-law, my delight, Naomi. We have her pressing and pressing and pressing her daughters to turn back and go take care of their life. Go have a life. I've been a parent long enough to know that the shortcomings and the faults, uh, the faults, as it were, of parenting are sufficient to wear you down where you recognize, you know what? I'm not the heritage. But that never was the point. That never was the offer. That never was the question. God is our heritage. And it's the trusting of the Lord that we're after. It's not the adjusting of our personal circumstances. And here's the hardest part about people who choose to go back to Moab, who repent from turning to the Lord wholeheartedly. You, you look at them and they go on and it looks like, well, it's fine. Remember last Sunday, Chris Peeler's message from Psalm 73? Their life is wonderful. Things are great. They prosper. They don't have troubles like everybody else have troubles as you, as you perceive it. And so we have to have more than visual reality. And mother, father, daughter, son, grandpa, grandmom, whoever you are, if you can't cast a vision for somebody to see beyond what we naturally see, you're simply not much help. Because the decisions, the most urgent decisions and the capacity to repent and to turn from naturalistic living in Moab, but the only way we could ever do that is seeing a bigger picture, seeing a bigger vision. <clears throat> and so she said, friend said, I'm, I'm continuing, and friend said, Ruth, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For wherever you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. For whether you, I, thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried the Lord do so more to me also, if anything but death part from me and thee. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking with her. The end of temptation is the resolution of heart, steadfastly in our heart. You know what? I'm going to follow where God is, and I'm not going to measure the cost. 
there was nothing, there was absolutely zero promise that Naomi could offer to Ruth. Zero. And she was emphatic. And I imagine one of the faults that parents have is this. We think that we have to provide such a perfect heritage for our kids, and all of a sudden when we're at the place where we no longer can do that, we think of ourselves as worthless and nothing. We, get, we give ourselves no value. The scripture says, honor your father and your mother. And there are those times where you don't even honor yourself. You think so poorly of yourself that you, you just don't have it in you and you have to see. <laughs> That's why it's a commandment. Honor your father and your mother is a commandment. Because it's not about your earthly parent. It's not about your earthly circumstances. It's about recognizing God as your God and your circumstances as his appointed circumstances and the source of your rich heritage, the source of your rich heritage. And so Ruth, with just a dash of perspective, could escape from all of that negativity of the ideas of Moab where you had to have your happy good life now. She set that all aside and she realized, you know what? My lot has been cast. And she honored her mother-in-law. She gave her mother-in-law value because she gave her mother-in-law's God value. And she did not want to be turned away from God in that pursuit. What an incredible, an incredible story as it continues. And we'll wrap it up here. <clears throat> so the two of them went and came to the house of bread. And it came to pass when they were come to the house of bread that the city was moved about them and they came and said, Is this my delight? And she said to them, Do not call me my delight. Call me Mara, bitterness. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. See the, see the Moabitic perspective? I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call you my delight? Seeing the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. This is the most crucial part of repentance and turning. When you and I reach this place where all we look at is the sorrow and the loss and the bitterness and we define ourselves by those moments of loss and bitterness and sorrow. We have nothing. We have nothing to exult in. But the thing that I want you to understand here is that at least she came back. She came back to her inheritance. Came back to the land of praise. And though she was very bitter, she couldn't even see that she had a daughter-in-law who was faithful. She just was an empty person. And it's important that we understand, pay attention, repentance first is doing the opposite of what I had been doing. And repentance second is enjoying the fruit of that term. So we don't see my delight walking in delight at this moment, though we will in the, in the pages ahead. But we see this. <clears throat> a simple concluding statement. So my delight returned. My delight repented. And friend, the one of my father, her daughter-in-law, with her. So we have these two women turning and repenting and doing the thing that is right in the spiritual reality without the visual world recognizing it. And she returned from the country of Moab and they came to the house of bread. In the beginning of the barley harvest, at the beginning of reaping of bread. What an incredible, incredible picture. And as we close here, I just want to ask you to think about a couple things here. When we try to go through a past, we're supposed to ask some personal questions like, what is the problem? Obviously, the superficial problem is um, famine drags the family away and leaves a 
a woman in desolation. How did it feel? This is a very easy passage to, to note how it feel, felt <laughs> because Naomi renames herself Mara, bitterness. And she, she had such despair, she had such poor feelings, she didn't have the slightest capacity to envision hope for her daughters-in-law. She had zero capacity. She wanted them to have a better life and her total conclusion was get away from me because I'm an accursed woman. But as we see what was happening before, I, I have to go back because this makes the closing argument so powerful to us. This is not, this is just, this is not an accident. Bethlehem, <laughs> the place of ashes and fruitfulness, fosters this story and one of the relatives, one of the offspring, excuse me, one of the ancestors of the Messiah gets brought into the fold of Moabitess in the 10th generation, gets brought into the family tree of Jesus. And it's so important for us to see. Do you see how much distance that you have to have eyes to see by? God is bringing beauty out of ashes. He's bringing fruitfulness out of ashes. And if you have ashes, you have that which you need. Bring it to the Lord, trust in him, rest in him. Don't go running around to save your own life. Let God work in his mysterious way, his wonders to perform. <clears throat> We've mostly focused today on what Naomi said. And she spoke so desperately out of her, biz, out of her bitterness. And we talked the last time about Ruth. She was captivated by loving kindness. <clears throat> but I just, I want us to understand, and this is why I titled the message this way, repentance, repentance can be so motivated in your life, to, to give up your whole life. Just, just think of it from Ruth's perspective for a moment. To give up your whole life, the anticipation of a husband, of a family, to give up everything, just to cling to ashes, to hold faithfully in love to this dear woman. That's such an incredible testimony, and that's what God's calling us to in Christ. To come to Christ, to repent, to walk after Christ, is to trust the Lord with all of our worries and fears, all of our desperations. All of our wanting to be like the women of Moab. To have this, to have that, to do this, to do that, all of that. And it's there and it can be had. And people are doing it on the right hand and on the left. But, praise God. Walk in the spirit of praise. Look around and see what God has done, see who God is. And your love for God will give you the ability to say no to the temptations of saving your own life. Was Orpah a bad woman? You could say, well, she obeyed her mother-in-law. She wasn't bad, but it's sad. It's sad that the counsel she received was earthy. And instead of drawing her to the Redeemer, to the place of praise, she simply said, she was told, you're not going to get anything on our watch. Go back to your people. And it's so easy. It's so easy to sell yourself short if you're looking at your immediate circumstances as if that's it. That's what your whole life is. So, what about you? Today, do we see choices between returning to save your life and turning to give it up and spend one's life out of a vision of greater value? Do we see that today? See that happening today? The answer is yes, you're supposed to say. Yes, we see that. <laughs> it's on the right hand and on the left. It's with a four-year-old in a sandbox. 14-year-old in a dress store. 24-year-old 
at a wedding party for somebody else. It's on the right hand and on the left in our culture. <clears throat> and you cannot, you cannot but choose the greater value. That's just how we're wired. Remember the story that Jesus told about the treasure hidden in the field? The perceived value in the natural mind is what the field is worth. The actual value is what's hidden from natural view. It's that treasure that's hidden in the field. And my dear brothers and sisters, my lovely friends and family, that's our opportunity. If we, if we will not see the greater treasure, you know, you know it's easy. It's, it's, once you see the treasure, we're all selfish. We'll grab the greater treasure. Jesus just wants us to have eyes to see the great price, the pearl of great price. He wants us to see the treasure. And the book of Ruth's gonna help us to get to see that in an astonishing way. Because what Jesus said is true. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what Ruth did. I'm gonna seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'm not gonna worry about whether I have a husband, whether I have any children. I'm not gonna worry about my personal circumstances. I'm gonna pursue God and that's my pursuit. But Jesus said, he'll take care of the rest. The Lord will add to you those things you need. And we need to trust that he will, and he will. Let's pray. So perhaps you're here today and you can identify with Ruth and with Orpah and with Naomi. You have some dirty ashes right now that you're holding in a basket of worthlessness. And you look around and you see others doing so well and having so much fun, being so gorgeous in the cultural standards, sought after. And you're tempted to turn back from following the Lord and to go back to the land of Moab. Father, we come in Jesus' name and in your loving kindness and in your tender mercy, I ask that you would bless our hearts today with that singular vision. I pray for dads and moms that they might have the capacity to paint that bigger reality of the treasure. Protect us, Lord, from our own bitterness and our personal circumstances that would cause us to fail to praise you. Help us come alongside those who are struggling with their sense of worth and value in their Moabitic circumstances. we can give them value. And Lord, also it's the turnaround is the same. Perhaps we can give value to others that they can't give to themselves, even as Ruth did. And, and grant, Lord, that as in your mercy you open our eyes to see the treasure, that we embrace it with that steadfastness of Ruth so that her mother-in-law stopped trying to convince her to go back. Lord, that that be our heritage, our victory, our glory, and our rich, exceedingly great reward, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.